On July 15, 1982, a gravedigger named George Kais was walking through the Cider Ridge Cemetery off of State Highway 84 in Blairstown, Warren County, New Jersey. He made his way toward the rear end of the cemetery, located in a wooded area, just over a steep bank which led down to a creek below. That's when the gravedigger noticed something in the grass. Upon closer inspection, he realized that the shape was actually a body, that of a young woman. He immediately notified police. The woman had been found lying on her back, partially clothed. Her face had been bludgeoned beyond recognition, and her body had started the process of decomposition. An autopsy revealed that she had died from blunt force trauma to the head, However, medical examiners could not determine the weapon that was used. Due to the level of decomposition, initially, authorities believed that the woman had died two weeks prior to her discovery. However, further examination would change the date to merely a few days prior to her discovery. The humidity in the area likely hastened the process. The medical examiner did not find any drugs in the woman's system, and, due to the rate of decomposition, her blood had fermented, making it impossible to determine if she had alcohol in her system. The medical examiner was not able to determine if she had been sexually assaulted. Due to the state of her body, no semen could be found. The victim was wearing a red, short-sleeved shirt and had a peasant-style skirt with a peacock print at the bottom. The skirt was laying over her legs. She was not wearing any undergarments. A golden cross necklace was found tangled in her hair. The victim had put up a fight, as the coroner noted defensive wounds on her arms and hands. Investigators determined that the girl was between the ages of 14 and 18, standing 5 foot 2 inches tall and weighing around 110 pounds. Police could not determine her eye color as her face had been shattered. Police hoped that she would be identified by a concerned parent using the detail of her distinct skirt. However, she never was. She was eventually given the name Princess Doe and laid to rest in a cemetery on July 22, 1983. A composite sketch of the victim would also be released in the newspapers. Soon, a witness would come forward after seeing photos of the clothes of the victim. She told police that she had witnessed the victim in a local supermarket two days prior to her body being found. Another woman would confirm the sighting several days later. The woman recalled that the victim was wearing a bun and was described as having a stoic expression. The police questioned employees at the local supermarkets, but none of them remembered seeing the young woman. Police would then encounter another woman, who told them that she had seen the victim a few days prior to her body being found. The witness, a motel employee, said that the girl had spoken to her when she checked into a room. The witness recalls the young woman asking if there were any jobs available, possibly as a house cleaner or a receptionist at the motel. The witness recalls that the young woman stated she was a runaway from Florida and was looking for a job. She also recalls the runaway mentioning that her father was a dentist. However, the witness could not remember the actual name of the victim. Over the years, police followed several leads, but to no avail. For many years, Princess Doe was believed to be Diane Janice Dye, a teenager who had disappeared from San Jose, California. In 2003, a DNA test of Princess Doe, utilizing Diane's mother's DNA, revealed that Princess Doe was in fact not Diane Dye. Over the years, several other missing women would also be ruled out. In 1999, police received a lead when Arthur and Donna Kinlaw confessed to murdering Princess Doe. Arthur and Donna had run a prostitution ring and had a history of crime, including robbery, forgery, welfare fraud, and murder. During questioning, Donna told investigators that her husband had murdered three girls, including the teenage girl found in the New Jersey Cemetery. She said that in July of 1982, her husband had brought home a teenage girl to use for prostitution, but he claimed that she was actually not worth recruiting, as he found her inexperienced. 
Donna recalls that he tried to sell the young girl to other pimps in the area, but failed, and eventually he decided to murder the girl. Donna told investigators that she witnessed Arthur committing the murder in the cemetery. She stated that he then burned his clothes and cleaned his vehicle. He threatened Donna to not tell the police. Donna recalls that the victim was from New York, possibly Long Island. Initially, Arthur refused to talk to investigators, but in 2005, he confessed to murdering Princess Doe. However, neither Donna nor Arthur remembered her name. Donna helped investigators create a new composite sketch of the victim, which matched the Princess Doe composites drawn earlier. Arthur was eventually sentenced to life in prison for two separate murders and Donna was convicted of manslaughter charges and released in 2003. However, Arthur was not charged for Princess Doe's murder as they could not confirm the couple's claims, and no charges could be brought until the identity of Princess Doe could be uncovered. In 2021, investigators, with the help of Astria Forensics Lab and National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, were able to extract DNA from degraded samples of Princess Doe's body and they constructed a DNA profile based on it. The DNA profile was sent to Innovative Forensic Investigations, who used genetic genealogy techniques to build a family tree. In doing so, they found a potential candidate for Princess Doe. Investigators then went to West Babylon in New York and collected a DNA sample from a potential brother and sister of the victim. On April 29, 2022, Princess Doe was finally positively identified as 17-year-old Don Olonik. Her brother told police that Don's parents had been divorced and that she had been living with her mother and sister in the neighborhood of Bohemia on Long Island. It is unclear whether Don left her home of her own accord or if she was ordered to do so by her mother, as different sources give conflicting reports. Police believe that after she left her home, she ran into Arthur Kinlaw. Kinlaw tried to lure her into prostitution, but when she refused, he instead drove her to New Jersey and killed her. Arthur Kinlaw was officially charged with Don Olonik's murder, based on additional evidence and witness statements. Arthur Kinlaw remains in prison at the Sullivan Correctional Facility in Fallsburg, New York. The case was finally solved after 40 years. Lacia Michelle Jackson was a 12-year-old girl living with her parents and older brothers in Conroe, Texas. She studied at Washington Junior High and loved going to the lake. On September 7, 1979, Lacia went to Lake Wildwood off FM 1485 in Conroe with her brothers. She spent most of the day swimming and playing at the lake, her favorite pastime. Later, when her brothers decided to head back home, Lacia said she wanted to enjoy a few more moments and told them that she would follow right behind them. Lacia did eventually follow and was spotted walking alone on Creek Bend Street towards her home. This would be the last time that she was seen alive. When she did not arrive home, her family went looking for her but could not find her anywhere. They eventually reported her missing to the police. A search was conducted for the missing girl and lasted throughout the night. The following day, her brother found her glasses. They were located at Creek Bend and Deep Forest Intersection, a location within the subdivision. An extensive search for the 12-year-old girl continued for six days. Then, on September 13, 1979, six days after Lacia's disappearance, an oil field worker found Lacia's body in a heavily wooded area along a pipeline off Exxon Road in Conroe. The area where her body was found was about five miles from where she was last seen. She had been found undressed. Her blue swimming suit and her shredded t-shirt were found at the crime scene. An autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and she had been strangled to death. Police found tire tracks at the crime scene that they believe was from the killer's vehicle. At the time of her disappearance, Lacia was wearing a gold butterfly necklace with a matching butterfly ring. While the necklace was found on her body, the ring was never located, and police postulate that the killer took the ring with him as a souvenir. 
Investigators hoped the ring would help link them to the killer. An extensive investigation into the 12-year-old's murder was launched. A few months later, police arrested a local Vietnam veteran suffering from PTSD after he confessed to the murder. However, he later retracted the confession, and as there was no evidence linking him to the crime, he was eventually released. Over the years, police followed several tips and interviewed multiple suspects, but no leads were derived and the case would eventually grow cold. Then, in October of 2021, investigators used a new technology called MVAC in order to retrieve DNA from Lacia's clothing. The MVAC machine aggressively sprays a sterile solution onto the surface while simultaneously applying a vacuum pressure in order to collect the solution and whatever possible DNA material is present on the surface. The solution and the DNA material are then run through a filter or a microcentrifuge in order to separate the DNA. MVAC technology helps investigators collect far more DNA than the traditional wet swab method. The DNA that was collected was then entered into CODIS. And in April of 2022, the DNA found on Lacia's clothing matched somebody in the database, one Gerald Dwight Casey. Casey had lived in Conroe at the time of the murder. Authorities were set to charge Casey for the murder, however, a search would reveal that he was already dead. It was found that he had been executed by lethal injection on the 18th of April, 2002, for a murder that he had committed in 1989. In 1989, Casey and his accomplice, Carla Smith, attempted to raise money for a trip to Florida, so they decided to sell furniture to a man named Daryl Pennington. However, Daryl changed his mind and backed out of the deal. In response, Casey and Smith decided to steal Daryl's gun collection. Daryl lived with a roommate named Sonia Howell. On July 10th, 1989, Casey entered Daryl's house and attempted to steal his gun collection. However, he encountered his roommate, Sonia, instead. Casey hit Sonia in the head with a telephone and then shot her multiple times. He was later caught and sentenced to death. On July 8, 2022, a blood sample taken from Casey in 1989 was conclusively and formally matched with the DNA found at the crime scene of Lacia's murder. Even though a suspect was not able to be tried, the case was finally considered solved after 43 years. Lindy Sue Beekler was a 19-year-old newlywed woman living with her husband, Philip Douglas Beekler, on 104A Kloss Drive at the Spring Manor Apartments in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Lindy worked at a flower shop, while her husband, Philip, worked at a Hertz rent-a-car. He was also studying at Millersville University in Millersville. On December 5th, 1975, Lindy worked a shift at her job at the flower shop and left her place of work at around 5.15 p.m. She stopped by her husband's workplace to pick up his paycheck. Lindy then went to the grocery store at John Hur's Village Market and arrived home at 7.15 p.m. to wait for her husband to return from work. Lindy's uncle and aunt had decided to visit her that evening in order to exchange dinner recipes. They arrived around 8.45 p.m. and found the apartment door unlocked. They opened the door and walked into the apartment, only to find a grisly sight. They discovered Lindy's lifeless body laying on her back near the living room. She had a knife sticking out of her neck, with a towel wrapped around the handle of the knife. They immediately notified police. The knife and the towel were taken from Lindy's home. An autopsy revealed that she had been stabbed 19 times with two different knives. The second knife was never found and it is believed that the killer brought the knife with him and took it away after the murder. Lindy had sustained wounds to her neck, chest, and upper abdomen and back. The medical examiner's report detailed that she had also been sexually assaulted there was no sign of a forced entry. Police found blood on the front door and the entranceway wall. They also found blood on the carpet. It is believed that Lindy fought her attacker fiercely. The killer did leave behind a large footprint marked in blood on the kitchen floor. 
None of the neighbors were at home at the time of the murder, so nobody saw or heard anything. A few weeks prior to her murder, Lindy had told her family and friends that she was being stalked. She said that she had felt that someone was following her and that she had seen someone peeking through the glass sliding door of her apartment. Police believed that the killer was already in her apartment or followed her home when she was carrying her groceries in. The police questioned family and friends. Her husband, Philip, was a suspect, but he was ruled out after it was confirmed he had been at work at the time of the murder. Over 100 people were interviewed, but to no avail. There would be no progress in the case for over a year. Then, almost one year later, in December of 1976, her family found that her gravestone had been vandalized. The headstone had been sprayed with red paint. It had also been chipped and scraped at, possibly by a knife. A few weeks later, Manor Township Police received an anonymous letter that was marked urgent. The letter claimed responsibility for both Lindy's murder and vandalizing her gravestone. The writer requested the letter be published in a newspaper, but police considered it a hoax and decided against it. Over the years, police interviewed several suspects, but none were ever charged. In 1997, Lancaster County District Attorney's Office sent a semen sample collected from Lindy's underwear in order for a male DNA profile to be created. In the year 2000, the DNA was entered into CODIS, but no match could be found. Then, in 2019, the District Attorney's Office sent the male DNA profile to Parabon Nano Labs, and they created a composite sketch of Lindy's killer. In 2020, genealogist C.C. Moore, using DNA, was able to create a family tree of a potential suspect. The suspect was of Mediterranean descent, possibly Italian. C.C. Moore found that the suspect had, quote, deep roots in the local Lancaster community. She also found that this potential suspect's family tree included numerous recent immigrant families from the tiny town of Gasparina, Italy. Eventually, they were able to pin down a suspect, David Sinopoli. Upon investigation, they found that Sinopoli had lived in the same apartment complex as Lindy. However, they still needed to confirm that he was the actual suspect, so they decided to surveil him. On February 11, 2022, investigators followed Sinopoli and his wife to the Philadelphia International Airport. Police watched as Sinopoli drank his coffee while waiting to catch his flight. He eventually threw his coffee cup in the trash can, and investigators were able to collect it. The DNA found on Sinopoli's coffee cup was then matched against DNA collected from Lindy's underwear. It was a perfect match. Investigators also learned of two spots of blood that were found on Lindy, which were of an unknown male's DNA. They compared it against the DNA from Sinopoli and confirmed that David Sinopoli was the killer. Police had always believed that the killer had cut himself during the knife attack. David Vincent Sinopoli, 68, was finally arrested and charged with one count of criminal homicide. Sinopoli was a former pressman at a commercial printing company. He would often go vacationing in Italy. At the time of Lindy's murder, he was married and had two children. He would later divorce his wife in 1986. He would marry his second wife in 1987. In 2004, Sinopoli had gotten a year-long probation for invasion of privacy and disorderly conduct after he was caught spying on a naked woman at a hair salon owned by his wife while they were getting a tan. He had no other criminal arrests and therefore was let go. Currently, he is being held in Lancaster County Prison with bail awaiting trial. The case was finally solved after 47 years.